thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Paul Rissom. Uh, I'm currently the uh, product manager for the BBC's research and education space, which is a uh, partnership with JISC and the BUFVC. Um, and we're helping to get the UK's uh, educational and cultural institutions online and available for educational research use across the UK. Um, but today I want to talk about something completely different and of course this technology isn't working properly so there we go. Right. Okay. Where do you get your ideas from? So on the 23rd of August 1994 Bill Drummond and Jimmy Corty, a.k.a. the K Foundation, a.k.a. also known as the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo, uh, or more popularly known as the KLF, um, uh, burnt a million pounds in cash. Um, they drove to the island of Jura off the coast of Scotland uh, and burnt the million pounds. To this day, they cannot explain why they did this. Seeking answers, they went to uh, visit the writer and practicing wizard, uh, Alan Moore, and they asked him the same question. They asked him the question he'd recently asked himself. Where does someone get their ideas from? How did they, how this, this idea to burn the million pounds get into their head? Now, to Alan Moore uh, and to any self-respecting artist, um, they believed that the answer to this question was of vital importance because... For any artist, it's a source of their income. If they don't have any new ideas, then they can't create anything new. Um, and they can't... Sorry, this connection keeps going. Um, <laughs> they can't kind of sustain their livelihood. Oh, this is... Sorry. Um, right. So, what Alan Moore came to realise is that the world we live in, despite all appearances, is not actually a physical one to make sense of the physical space in which we find ourselves. We create ideas and concepts in our mind, and that is how we mediate our lives. He called this conceptual world idea space. Knowing where you get your ideas from was a key question. Um, and he came up with this idea of I idea space, which has all the concepts and ideas that we come up with, and that's how we navigate our lives. Moore defined the act of taking a concept or an idea that's in idea space and transforming it into being something real, something that could be touched, something that could be pointed at, something that could be manipulated as magic. Designing web. So this is the BBC Flash Programs uh, platform. And this exists to give uh, one page for every single program that the BBC has ever produced. It follows the basic ideas of uh, linked data, that kind of thing. So that means that, uh, so this site ensures that every TV and radio program has a permanent findable web presence. Because, as I'm sure a lot of you already know, the World of Web isn't just formed, uh, founded to share documents, but to connect identify and share ideas. So it isn't the documents that are interesting, it's the things that they are about. For instance, uh, you can find all the episodes of Doctor Who, uh, from the latest Christmas special, all the way back to the beginning, in 1963. It gives you all the production metadata, so when it was on, who was in it, uh, genres, when you might be able to buy it, when you might be able to see it next. But the single episode of a TV show is only the beginning. Once you start watching or listening to that TV show, then you kind of don't really care about the broadcast information anymore. What you care about is what happens inside the program. So what you're going to talk about afterwards is the characters and what happens to them. So, being a Doctor Who fan since about 1991, I put two and two together uh, and started mapping out the content of some episodes of Doctor Who. I came up with this. So, like Slash Programs, I started with, you've got all the episodes at the top there, and you can divide a consistent run of episodes into a series. Then you take a particular series and dive down into that. So then I took the main events of a particular episode um, and traced the characters' movements in and out of the episode. 
So that was the first thing you could do with this. The most notable thing of this particular episode is that the Doctor hardly appears. He's right at the beginning in the blue dot, in the middle, and then right at the end. What else could you do, though? So this episode is one that involves quite a lot of uh, time travel. So we see, and the viewers see, the events from the perspective of Sally Sparrow. Um, so everything basically happens to her in 2007, I think it is. The last thing that happens to her is that she meets the Doctor. But from the Doctor's point of view, the first thing that happens to him is he meets Sally, and then everything else happens. So it's the same events, but in different orders. So this starts to show you that, despite all appearances, stories aren't really linear narratives. A linear narrative is a thing that we lay on top of a kind of more wider network that's actually inherent in the story world. <coughs> so stories aren't just straight lines, they're webs. So unsurprisingly, we weren't the first to figure out that stories are webs by a long shot. This is Aristotle, who basically wrote the book on drama. Um, it's particularly tragedies, but it is a book that's informed our approaches in the modern world. And Aristotle says, plot is a web of events that make each other likely or necessary. Much of reading a work of fiction or experiencing a work of drama is trying to figure out what the future implications of something are or trying to work out why something happened based on what happened previously. So from the beginnings of narrative, we've always acknowledged that stories are in fact webs and that we do this kind of uh, cognitive work to try and make sense of the network of narrative behind it. Indeed, the academic Jason Mattel describes stories as systems of information management, likening the, as I said, the viewing experience to a cognitive work where viewers actively construct the story world in their mind as they watch. Part two. At the BBC's Birmingham offices, there is an entire cabinet filled with index cards with acres of information about characters and events from the popular agricultural soap, The Archers. Now, we're in the process of digitising these cards now with the hope that one day we can release them uh, as something for audience to, to explore, possibly even as an open data set, which would be nice. But these cards reminded me of something else I'd seen recently. At a country house in Caversham, near Reading, BBC Monitoring keeps an eye on the rest of the world's media, and they keep an especially close eye on those in power. Which leads us to this, a biography of Nelson Mandela. All the significant events in his life portrayed through the world's media. and up to this, when he's released from prison. Carefully typed ongoing histories of significant people. So here we have narratives, both fictional and factual, with almost exactly the same data structure. Because in the end, that's what news is made up of. Events, people's lives, the way they're interpreted, and they're strung together in narratives that help us make sense of the world. This same approach works for pretty much every narrative that we've tried to put into it. Um, even Shakespeare hasn't been immune from our story webs. <coughs> but this happens in our day-to-day -day consumptions of story too. Who here listened to Serial, the podcast, first series? Yeah, yeah. a few people. Um, so the folks at uh, Vox Media, an American company, did so as well. Uh, and although they loved it, they began to lose track of what was going on. So this is an extract from their Slack channel. Who is Dom? Exactly, I'm starting to lose track of characters. We should make a map, put it on the site. Um, so with only the traditional audio-based linear narrative to grab hold of, they were starting to lose track of what was going on. So they made this. This allows you to pick an episode and see all the characters, where they're involved, that kind of thing. That kind of thing. So a note of caution. What I'm not talking about here is branching narratives and choose your own adventure, that kind of thing. I'm not asking people to uh, force themselves into writing those kind of branching narratives because 
for one thing, the combinatorial explosion inherent in doing so makes it very hard to come up with a satisfying ending, a satisfying coherent story indeed. The strength of the link isn't necessarily just about navigation, it's about meaningful connections. So I'll make a bold claim. Every creative work we ever produce is already a web. We don't need to kind of, you know, create these artificial webs. Everything we create is already a web. We've just never had the medium before to experience it as such. We've become used to the idea of stories being purely linear because we've confused the experience of storytelling with the content itself. Just because the process or telling of consuming a story is linear doesn't mean that the narrative world below is linear and fixed. It's a web. It's always been a web. So by concentrating on just creating linear or even branching user journeys or hierarchical sitemaps, we're falling into the same trap of recreating linear experiences rather than true user-centered uh, design, creating the world online. To reaffirm, this is happening. Uh, more and more, we're going to see narrative data as important to how we consume and navigate through media. This is Amazon's X-ray feature, which is starting to started on books and is starting to appear on film and TV as well. So this, then, is the truth revealed to us through the advent of the web. We make sense of the world through narrative, and those narratives in are in and of themselves webs. So a few years ago, I was asked to interview uh, a few of my colleagues in the user experience and design department at the BBC um, to ask them what they felt about information architecture. Uh, one of them said, information architects aren't creative. They don't seem to want to imagine the future. They're too pragmatic. They're obsessed with the details of what's possible now or not possible. Now, don't get me wrong. I strongly believe that good functionality, simplicity, accessibility, those are hugely important things. Giving the user what they want, getting them to the intended content or transaction as quickly and easy as and efficiently as possible. And yet, that's surely true of any business which takes user experience seriously. But information architects is not creative. I don't believe that to be true. And if we are to be creative, we need to understand the medium that we're operating in. Scott McLeod, who you may recognize from this very accurate photo, uh, wrote a book called Understanding Comics, which is kind of the seminal book on why comics should be taken seriously as an art form. And he says, the creation of any work in any medium will always follow a certain path. He describes six steps. So he talks about um, the idea or purpose, by which he means the conceptual content of the work, the form it will take, so whether that's going to be a book or a chair or a song uh, or even a comic, the idiom, so that's the school of art, the genre, that kind of thing, the structure, so what to leave out, what to how to arrange and compose the work, the craft, so the actual process of construction, problem solving, you know, getting the actual job done, and finally surface, the production values, the finishing, the immediate aesthetics. Now in the world of UX, uh, we talk a lot about the latter block of three, the structure, the craft, and the surface. But I believe it's the first three that we need to investigate a whole lot more. When you say website to somebody, um, that means a certain thing. That means the thing that we've grown up with in the last 30 years or so, or 20 years or so. Uh, a hierarchical sitemap, a desktop visual design, a contact us form. And yet we know instinctively this is changing. That as an industry and as a medium, we're still very much in the early days. We love to point out, indeed, how things are changing. More more screen sizes, more different devices, uh, more inputs. Yet we don't seem to take the time to investigate the fundamental properties of this medium that we call the web. If we did, I think we'd rethink a lot of our approaches to our work and our practice and end up in a far more creative future. Uh, this is a piece of work called Spirits Melted Into Air by uh, the design and technologist uh, Tom Armitage. 
So he was commissioned by the Royal Shakespeare Company and uh, Caper to explore how one might creatively visualise uh, various Shakespearean soliloquies. So Tom took video footage of actors kind of walking around the stage, performing, traced their movement across the stage as they performed, and then printed out these paths as paper visualisations and also as laser-cut crafted wooden pieces. Now, when describing an element of his working practice, Tom talks about the process of material exploration. Uh, which is a common technique for product designers and artists. He explains that invention comes from design, and until the data has been exposed to designers in a way that they can explore it and manipulate it and come to an understanding of what design is made possible by that data, there is essentially no product. There we go. To invent a product, we need to design, and to design we need to explore the material. It's as simple as that. Now, too often, I'd argue, we get this balance the wrong way round. We start by exam examining existing user behaviours, coming up with user journeys that recreate and maybe slightly improve upon the old forms in a new medium. It's almost like skeuomorphism for UX as a whole. Then we take pixels and interactions as our sole material, uh, and the data and the information architecture only really comes after the real creative work is done and is used to bring it to life. But as Tom explains, there's an equally more valid way of looking at this. Forgive me for using the uh, well-worn analogy of Lego bricks, but would you only ever really use them to construct something from a well-defined plan? No, the real pleasure of playing with Lego is in tipping the box of bricks all over the floor and building silly, new, unexpected things out of them. This is what we need to learn to do a lot more. If we're to, create, uh, if we're to treat information architecture as a creative discipline, if, we're able, if we want to treat the web as a creative medium. The role of an architect isn't just to guide and build something to a predefined plan. It's to un know and understand the warp and the weft of the materials to hand, as well as the vision, and to sculpt something incredible. Which is different from big data. It's not about just taking a mass of data and trying to tell a story from it. As mentioned, I mean, stories are so much more than just the objects within them. But equally, data isn't just quantitative. It's not just numbers. Data can be ideas. It can be concepts. It can be the links between those things. And as we've seen, Stories and narratives are webs. This is James Bridal. Um, he's written a lot about um, this thing he calls the new aesthetic, which is about coming to terms with the nature of a networked world. Uh, and one of the key facets of that networked world is how, and this is his words, every web page, every essay, every line of text written or quoted then in, is a link to other words, other thoughts, other ideas. The hyperlink, indeed, isn't necessarily something new. It's revealing to us that even our most traditional forms of literature and art have always been hyperlinked. We've just never had the medium to truly explore this possibility. In case I haven't made myself clear, I believe that data is the natural form for the medium we all work in, and that if we're considering a creative approach to the web, to information architecture, to the screens, to the journeys. The personas and things like that aren't the point. Designing, sculpting the data into the right useful shapes, those, that's the key. What I mean, therefore, by acknowledging the network is that we should consider everything we create, every service, every product, every cultural artifact, to be a network in and of itself. Not only is it connected to other things, but the work within itself is its own micro-network of ideas and concepts. Every creative work we design, we should think of as a web, and we should enable it to be experienced as one. I am a web designer. I design webs. Okay. So we have a medium. URIs, and we have hyperlinks, and we have a form, a network, 
an actual web, not just the web as a platform. But what can we do with this? How can we be creative? The Internet of Things. Physical objects that have a connection to the network and can therefore use the capabilities of the network to augment their functionality. Arduinos and all that kind of thing. Probably not the sort of stuff that UX folk particularly have been involved in so far. But without UX folk, without information architects and designers, we traditionally get something like this. The annoying talky toaster from Red Dwarf, whose only reason is to toast and will forever be offering you a slice of toast. Because um, it doesn't understand the world you live in. Uh, my friend Michael recently summed this up in a great way. Information architect for things without screens. That would be a good job. Which is exactly the point. As the number of devices and inputs and possible ways of outputting information increase, beyond, frankly, our ability to keep up with them, we either have two choices. We pick a few of the varieties just designed for them and have a limited impact and a nagging sense of dissatisfaction, or concentrate first on designing the thing that won't change, regardless of all the above, the raw information. Then even if you choose a few devices or inputs, you'll still have the freedom to easily change your mind without having to completely start again. Indeed, what the in Internet of Things gives us is something new. Russell Davies describes the Internet of Things like this. What's happening now is that the web of data wants to escape the screen. It wants to materialize in the real world. It wants to get physical. It wants to become <coughs> objects. Now, does that remind you of anything? Magic is the process by which ideas leave idea space and manifest themselves in the physical world. The Internet of Things is not just about fridges. It is, by Alan Moore's definition, literally magic. So why should we limit ourselves to putting stuff on the web which is mundane and physical? If we're to truly engage with the network world, we need spaces to play. We need to make mistakes. More importantly, if the open data out there is only administrative and scientific, then that limits us as a society. It limits the boundaries of idea space on the web. So I don't just want the Internet of Things, I want the Internet of Fictional Things as well. But it's not just magic, it's something even more powerful. Practical alchemy for beginners. Now, my understanding of alchemy until very recently, well, that's just turning base metal into gold. But let's take a look at some of the laws of alchemy, which you may have noticed sprinkled throughout the talk. An alchemist must have a medium for any form of alchemy to succeed. Well, we have that. We have a medium. We have a way in which information can be represented and transferred from people. We have the medium of the web, of URIs and of hyperlinks. Next one. In order for true alchemy to operate, an alchemist must fully understand the structure of matter. He must, or she must, possess the sight, the ability to not see an object as a whole, but as a structure constructed of trillions upon trillions of atoms. And I've shown you how that's true. How, for instance, every story isn't just the whole thing, it's a web in and of itself. But there's one more law of alchemy, which is probably the most important law of all. And it concerns these. These are the weeping angels. They are a perfect example of alchemy. As above, so be low below. Or rather, the symbol of an object is equivalent to an object itself. The basic alchemic principle is that a physical object can be affected by the manipulation of a symbol of that object. Now, does that sound familiar? A URI can be used as a symbol of an object. And the Internet of Things gives us a way to interact with those symbols and therefore manipulate a physical object. This is what we have URIs for. This is what we have the Internet of Things for. This is APIs. The angels arose, they were thought of. They stepped out of our dreams and into the world. They are not science, but magic through and through. They are symbols with power. We are in this world now. 
The web is the medium by which we can bring ideas into the world. We, as people who work with the web, can not only be creative, we can be magicians, we can be alchemists. So, in summary, if you're thinking about designing webs, doing stuff online, you need to think about webs, not just websites. Um, you need to explore the web as an actual medium, not just as a platform for distribution. Um, you need to engage with the network world by you know, treating cultural things as a web and, and trying, you know, trying things out, trying to be playful with that as well. Uh, and I would argue that <coughs> APIs and the Internet of Things show that magic and alchemy are possible. Which means that, for instance, these two men weren't just geniuses. The Internet isn't just a platform for existing media. It's a medium in and of itself and we need to start making creative works attuned to that medium. But not just that. These men are secret alchemists, and magic really is possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>